All right, this is part two of the presentation on Alexander Pope. In this part, we will be talking about two poems. We'll talk about The Rape of the Lock first, and then we will talk about Eloisa de Avalar. So, The Rape of the Lock. This poem uh, was composed at the suggestion of Pope's friend, John Carroll to whom the poem is actually dedicated in its third line. The story of The Rape of the Lock originated in a real incident when a man named Robert Peter, there he is, uh, publicly cut off a lock of his fiancee, Arabella Farmer's hair, uh, enraging her and causing a great rift between the two families. This is like a, a well, it's all very, very silly. So the idea was to, uh, to write this poem and try to to use it to, to, to make light of the situation. Um, and it appeared in 1712. And in its original form, it was only two cantos and not, not the five canto version that we have. Um, the, the textbook reproduces the later version of the poem, which is much better than the two canto version of 1712. Um, both Arabella and Lord Peter moved on and married different partners. And Lord Peter actually uh, died of smallpox less than a year after the appearance of the poem that would immortalize him. I think he was he was only 23 at the time. I think, I think his wife was 16 and she was pregnant with their first child uh, when he died. Uh, the Rape of the Lock sold well at the time, and Pope revised and expanded it to five cantos in 1714. Uh, the major change was the addition of the supernatural machinery. That's Pope's word. Uh, the machinery of invisible spirits, the, the sylphs and the gnomes, uh, the salamanders, involved in the main action of the poem. The final version, published in 1717, added Clarissa's speech and the final in the final canto to, uh, and I'm quoting from the poem, to open, to open more clearly the moral of the poem. The Rape of the Lock is perhaps the best known example we have uh, in English poetry of what is, what is called mock heroic literature. This was a genre that was popular in both England and France in the early 18th century. Essentially, the idea is to borrow some of the plot and style of ancient epic poetry and use it to satirize contemporary society. So by presenting fastidious manners and petty disputes in such grandiose packaging, Pope wants the reader to see how ridiculous it is to take such matters seriously. And the, the opening couplet of the poem is, is quite well known. What dire events from amorous causes springs what mighty contests rise from trivial things. So in order to understand this as mock heroic, we have to talk about or, or understand some of the conventions of ancient epic. And I've listed some of them here. Uh, supernatural agents involved in mortal affairs. You read the great epics of Homer. The gods are very involved um, in the war um, uh, between... Um, between Greece and Troy. Elaborate descriptions of religious ritual and sacrifice are a common feature of ancient epic poetry. Prolonged battle scenes and contests, long declamatory speeches, a journey to the underworld or catasis. And finally, the apotheosis of mortal characters. They become immortal. Uh, they, they, they join the gods, so to speak. So there are other features of epic poetry, but these are the ones that I think are most relevant for reading The Rape of the Lock. So some questions for you to think about as you read this poem is wh where do you see Pope employing the conventions of ancient epic poetry, uh, the ones that I just listed for you? And what do they contribute to the humor of the story? How do they enhance Pope's satirical motivation? A second set of questions, who delivers the moral of the story? And what is the moral in the first place? Uh, and in what ways 
is that moral consistent with Pope's values as expressed in the moral essays? Uh, the, the epistle to Richard Boyle, for example, or um, um, the essay on man, or looking ahead to the essay we're going to read next, next time on the characters of women. So think about in what ways uh, the rape of the lock uh, expresses um, Pope's values. The second poem that we're, we're, we're reading is Eloisa de Abelard, and this is an earlier poem as well, um, 1717, so he, he published it the same year as the final version of The Rape of the Lock. Here we see a couple of pilgrims praying at the shrine of Eloisa and Abelard. They were real people. So in The Rape of the Lock, Pope satirically compares Belinda's grief over the theft of, of a lock of her hair to the grief of Dido, the queen of Carthage, when the Trojan hero Aeneas leaves her behind to conquer Italy. This is from, uh, uh, we can see this, I think it's, uh, yeah, Canto 5, lines 5 and 6 of um, The Rape of the Lock, where this comparison is made. Virgil in the Aeneid movingly describes the separation of Dido and Aeneas. Uh, and when the Roman poet Ovid composed the Heroides, which is a series of heroic epistles in the voices of abandoned women, so, so Ovid uh, adopts the voice of a woman uh, lamenting um, being abandoned or, or, or left behind or widowed, uh, he chose Dido, Ovid did, as one of the protagonists for his Heroides. Pope translated one of Ovid's epistles while still a teenager, and Eloisa de Abelard represents his contribution to the genre, to the heroic epistle genre. It was a poem um, that gained an appeal towards the end of the century as Augustan tastes waned and poetry began to take a romantic turn. Uh, and, and it's really a remarkable poem because as a product of Pope's imagination and cultural milieu, it is unusual in a number of respects. It is not satire. It is written in the voice of a woman. And it explores sympathetically the vicissitudes of human passion. So th those things make this poem really stand out. The occasion for the poem may have been the departure of Pope's friend, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and we're going we're gonna to read some work by Montague a little later in the semester. She left England with her husband for Turkey in 1716, the year before this poem was published, and Pope apparently had strong, unrequited feelings for her at this time. And this seems to be indicated by Eloisa in the closing lines of the poem, and I went ahead and put a passage up here. She says, And sure if fate some future bard, some future poet, shall join in sad similitude of griefs to mine, condemned whole years in absence to deplore, and image charms he must behold no more, such if there be who loves so long so well. Let him our sad, our tender story tell. The well-sung woes shall soothe my pensive ghost. He best can paint him who shall feel him most. This seems to be talking about Pope here, Pope himself. And so uh, some readers, some scholars draw a, a link here between Eloisa's feelings in this poem and Pope's feelings for Lady Mary Wortley Montague. The sad and tender story that she mentions in the stanza I just read, the sad and tender story of Eloise's love for Peter Abelard was not Pope's invention. It was a well-documented, tragic love affair between the 12th century scholar Peter Abelard and his pupil, Eloisa. Her correspondence with him, her letters survive, and it was important uh, in the later development of epistolary fiction or novels told in letters, and we're going to look at some novels told in letters later in the semester. Her letters had been translated by the poet John Hughes and published in 1713, and Pope acknowledged a creative debt to Hughes in the preface to his poem.
So some questions for you to think about as you're, as you're reading the poem or as you're uh, going back through and looking at it a second time. What role does setting play in the poem? How do Eloise's surroundings enhance her feelings? Uh, and how do her feelings color her surroundings? From the beginning, Eloisa is torn between cold, chaste piety on the one hand and hot sexual passion on the other. What stands out to you about this conflict? And finally, what are the qualities of true love, according to Eloisa? How does she define marriage, applying her terms, and what ways might love and marriage seem incompatible? And looking forward to part three, where we will talk about the characters of women, one of the moral essays, the epistle to, to Arbuthnot, and his great satirical uh, mock epic, The Dunciad. <laughs>